I am just going to be doing a roundup of the section on the Great Depression. At this point, you should have, you know, read through the textbook and some of the articles that I have uploaded onto Google Classroom, as well as looked at some of those videos. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's fine if you can't make the online lessons, it's absolutely okay, but... Um, I mean, I think it'll be quite helpful if you, if you, well, clearly you are listening or watching this, this PowerPoint. And remember, when we go back to school, we will be recapping and going through this. So none of you will be, you know, would have missed out. So just in terms of the section, we're focusing on essentially the crisis of capitalism in America. We have come from an intense focus on communism, and we use the case study of Russia. So we looked at this, you know, the the fall of Tsarist Russia and the rise of the Bolsheviks, and ultimately, you know, the USSR. And we ended up after looking at um, Stalin and his five year plans. And now we've taken a shift, you know, like a one eighty shift, going from. Um, communism which stands you know on the left to almost like the right in terms of capitalism and we're looking at america and we're taking it back to post world war one and you know world war one that america ended on top you know america comes out on a high uh being incredibly successful having done really really well during world war one and um and then ultimately, in 1929, um, crashing. And we look at the, you know, that journey of the so-called Roaring Twenties to the Great Depression. What were those causes? And what, were the great, what was the Great Depression? Once we're done with the section, the next section looks at the recovery from the Great Depression. Now, just on this cover page of this powerpoint you can see i put in something there uh, you know mentioning black thursday and wall street and panic uh, stocks crash most of you would have heard of the you know the Wall the wall street stock exchange wall street where um, stocks are traded in america and um and this was you know that particular day where things just went all wrong and i have you know, in a previous lesson online, compared this to almost like the assassination of Franz Ferdinand, where that was the shot that was heard around the world. And for me, this was the culmination of everything. So there were a few ongoing causes that led to the Great Depression in America. There were long-term weaknesses in the American economy and how America was functioning. And the crash of the stock exchange on the 24th of October 1929 actually was just the final straw. You know, when we say the straw that broke the camel's back, that's that's ultimately what it was. Now, the first thing we're going to look at is what was the nature of capitalism? And you'll find this on page 60 in your textbook. I like this picture here. Um, it just, it kind of epitomizes what America was at that time. You know, they talk about world's highest standard of living. There's no way like the American way. Where in America, they were talking, you know, so much about just the success that people can achieve, the American dream, the fact that, you know, you the harder you work, the better you'll do, the richer you will be. But at the same time, if you look at this picture here, you have got a number of people Poor people, African American people generally, you know, who are lining up for perhaps some sort of collection. So, just indicating to you that clearly the so called prosperity of America, especially in the 1920s, wasn't being achieved by everybody. It wasn't as easy as the politicians were pushing at that time. Now, in America, in terms of capitalism, the first thing to ask is, what is capitalism? Your basic definition of capitalism will include things like, you know, a free market economy, privatization, uh, where people can own businesses, they can, there's no government, uh, you know, involvement. It's the complete opposite of communism, where, you know, in communism, there's often price setting, 
uh, it's a centralized economy, it's a planned economy. Capitalism, you know, I've always given these examples to you. I can open a bakery on one street corner opposite me. Another person can open a bakery. Two doors down, a person, another person can open a bakery. And there's no limitations to that. There's no limitations to the prices we can set and things like that. And, you know, it also links to this idea of being entrepreneurial. And they used historically, and you can see this on page 60, you know, a lot of examples of people who, you know, were entrepreneurial in the sense that they opened their own businesses, they started from, you know, that whole rags to riches story, they did really well, and they achieved that so-called American dream, where everybody can do well. The leader at the time in America is a man called Herbert Hoover. Now, Herbert Hoover came into power at a great time and lost power because of what actually happened. Herbert Hoover was a great proponent of the so-called concept of rugged individualism. You know, rugged individualism being that, you know, that every man for himself kind of concept. That if you can do it, I can, you know, uh, anybody can do it. That each, you know, um, I will work hard and I will do well. If I could do it, you don't need assistance. You can do it too. But we know the reality is that that's not necessarily how life actually works. Hoover was also quite famous for having, you know, made statements like, um, you know, in America, there will always be a chicken in every pot and like a car in every garage or driveway, something to that equivalent. Just talking about the success. And there was this, there, there was this impression in America, especially in the 1920s, that success would be ongoing that there would never be an end to the success and that just that they will continue to reach new heights. The problem is, and I've said it to you before as well, is that, you know, what goes up must come down. And that's ultimately what happens in America. They reach a height that they can't, they can't actually maintain for too long. The other thing that's mentioned here on the slide is this whole concept of a laissez-faire government. And a laissez-faire government is a government that has like little to just no involvement, especially in terms of the economy and what companies can do. And how this translated was, and you'll see this later on when I point out a few examples and a few things that went wrong, is that anybody, any essentially Tom, Dick and Harry could go and trade on a stock exchange. Anybody could get a loan. Um, There was just very minimal government controls. Which also then just meant that the economy often was unchecked and people's actions were unchecked. Now, we talk about what caused this capitalist boom. What just resulted in America, you know, going just to new heights. Look at this picture. I mean, this picture is a typical example of what was going on at that time. You know, this the industrialization that was happening. The you know we talk about the factory assembly line, and the fact that things were becoming increasingly mechanized, and that you had rapid production, mass production, um, and what you could produce in a week was what people were before producing in a month or two months because everything became so much more specialized and mechanized. The rapid growth as a result of World War I, especially because, you know, at the end of World War I, America, you know, is doesn't have those physical losses, those damages that, you know, the rest of the world who were, you know, who were involved in World, world War I had because there was no fighting that took place on American soil. So if you think about it, you know, places like, Britain and France were heavily damaged. America ends up being the number one money lender at the end of World War I. They end up, um, you know, giving massive loans to other company, no, other countries and doing really, really well. As well as because, you know, they, they were big weapon suppliers and things like that during the war. And of course, you know, Government policies at that time, one of you know, we're talking about the lazy affair policy and things like that, but one of the other policies that actually happened, and it you need to remember this policy, and it's got to do with something like your tariffs, your um, import tariffs, is that the idea is that you need to encourage your country, your people to be 
buying locally. And to prevent Americans from having, you know, increasing imports, what the American government did was they imposed tariffs. So now your tariff would be the equivalent of, so, so a lot of us buy online. So a lot of us do online shopping. And when you buy something like clothes from ASOS or um, I'm trying to think, or Wish, and because South Africa produces clothes here, the government is saying, mm, you're buying in something that you could buy in South Africa. So we, you're going to have to pay a fee for buying that. And that fee is at for clothes is 40%. So when that when that comes in on top of the price that you have paid for the item, you will still pay 40% as well as then your VAT fee of 15%. Now, in America, that was what was um, that was what was happening at that time, where the government imposed all these tariffs on the imports of agriculture and things like that. Do you think now? the European countries would stand back and allow that to happen. They, in turn, imposed their own tariffs on American goods that were being um, exported to their countries. Another thing that was happening at that time is, you know, we mentioned higher purchase and advertising, is that there were loads of new inventions, something like, I mean, in your textbook, there was the one advert for the Electrolux vacuum cleaner, refrigerators, um, TVs, um, and, and those sort of things. Um, so people now needed to buy this, but they didn't necessarily have cash for it. One of the things that they were allowed to do was buy and higher purchase. Now that meant only putting a 10% deposit in terms of the price and thereafter paying, but of course paying at higher interest. And people were, you know, these new forms of advertising, print and radio advertising, really, really, really encourage people to buy these things and so you had um, a lot of companies selling everything on higher purchase but not actually um, getting in cash because people were paying in installments and that becomes a big problem especially when we look at what happens later on um, and then of course here yeah, I mentioned the weak um, you know trade unions that weren't really protecting people and doing their jobs because America always associated trade unions with communism. And so uh, trade unions didn't actually, um, you know, weren't actually established well there. So it just allowed capitalism to grow unchecked, as well as workers, for instance, to be taken advantage of in terms of salaries and things like that. Now, uh, we are, sorry, I just want to, so what caused the capitalist boom in the 20s? Now we're going to be looking at the weaknesses in the U.S. economy. And that is on page 70. If you look at this picture here, I mean, we talk about, you know, the jobless men and um, like unemployment. Not every industry prospered in America at that time. There were agriculture, for instance, did not prosper. And one of the reasons was because of those tariffs. Um the, you know, in terms of they couldn't really, ex, you know, exporting became a problem for them, as well as the government neglected the agricultural industry. They, you know, they pushed a lot of focus on other stuff, other developments, just in terms of like, you know, cars and other industrial developments. And so you had unemployment. In fact, what ends up happening is that a lot of agricultural workers start becoming urbanized and moving into cities to, to get jobs, which increases the amount of unemployment. And there, of course, is, uh, you know, a large amount of inequality in America, especially because of, I mean, we're talking about racism here at that time in terms of African-Americans, and it was an increasing amount of racism. At this point, we then did activity 72, sorry, activity 3.1 on page 72 in the textbook, and that focused on um, just, you know, like the, the one source where it was the advert on the Electrolux and the kind of techniques and tactics used to encourage people to buy and to, um, and essentially how a lot of, uh, how many people just fell into a, into a death spiral.
Um, a lot of you are quite familiar with what the U.S. society was like in the 1920s. And this is just a few examples on page 73 in the textbook. And I mean, this picture here is a typical example of America at that time. Uh, you know, with the flap address, the parties and things like that. Uh, you guys are familiar with the term, the Roaring Twenties, especially if you've, you know, you've read or you've watched um, The Great Gatsby or Of Mice and Men. There, there are a number of texts on like novels and plays and things from that time or who, which capture the essence of that time. And, you know, the first thing it talks about here is that there was just this huge consumer society where... People were buying clothes and they were buying, um, you know, just appliances and things like that. And it was new and it became very easy for them to do it because they were able to buy it on higher purchase, on credit. They could just go into banks and get loans, uh, high interest loans, but they weren't thinking about that. There were also no checks and balances. So you didn't have to go in there with a salary slip to prove that you can afford to pay for that loan. Um, and then again, like I use that term, the Roaring Twenties, to say that this is what they refer to that time, uh, you know, time as. When we talk about women at that time, women were, you know, were white women who were allowed to vote. Um, women's fashions changed. Women became a lot more prominent, and especially after World War One, because women had um, worked in a lot of male-dominated industries at that time. Something that is quite, um, you know surprising for that time considering the amount of parties and things like that was that it was an era known as the prohibition era where alcohol the sale of alcohol was banned didn't mean that it stopped happening it just happened illegally and often at these places called speakeasies that um you know were sometimes literally underground clubs so where they would open these hatches and people would walk down the stairs and there would be these bars and clubs and there'd be like jazz music and things being played at that time. Um, prohibition actually was one of the, the things that were overturned when it came to recovering from um, the Great Depression. And then of course racial discrimination. I, I have mentioned this previously but there was an, in, you know, an increase in terms of um, just racial discrimination against African American people, and then you are also quite aware of you know the segregation and the segregatory laws that existed in America at that time, as well as at that time the increasing um, restrictions on immigration from certain countries, um, that, you know, including European countries, um, as well into America. So I just want to go back here. You know, we can. If we had to think about, you know, what were the problems in America at that time that would lead to something like the Great Depression, we can immediately see the fact that people were just spending too much. There wasn't enough government involvement in terms of how businesses were were being run. That um, you know there were there was just too much credit that um, like the agricultural industry was being completely um, neglected. So there's already all these problems in the works. Ultimately, these problems you know lead to that pinnacle, which is the Wall Street crash that happens in 1929. Now, when it comes to Wall Street and just in terms of trading on a on a stock exchange or trading on the stock market. Now you need a license to do that, but back then, anybody was able to do it in America. Anybody could. Um, and you had normal people who would just go, and they would hear these things about these businesses doing well, and they had what we called, you know, they spoke about this unwavering optimism, that these businesses were just going to do continually well. So more and more people actually invested and bought shares in specific companies, to the point that... A lot of the time, the, the the value of those shares were even higher than the true worth of that company. You often had a lot of speculation, so you had people who were speculators who would, you know, who would decide and who would be just constantly trading on the stock market and then especially buying on the margin. Now, buying on the margin was um, being able to buy on credit, so buying stocks on credit or shares on credit. So. What you would do is if you had to buy $20,000 worth of shares, you would then um, only put down 
are only required to put in on 10% deposit. And thereafter, once you made your money, you would then pay back what you owed. And of course, with some interest. That is on the assumption that everything was going to go well. That was on the assumption that those shares were, you know, were going to continue to rise and that you would come out with a profit so that you would come out with maybe thirty or forty thousand dollars so that when you paid back your twenty thousand dollars and then your interest on that you would still have a profit but after a while what ended up happening is that people started getting a bit nervous and you had increasingly you know at one point people started disinvesting and black thursday was essentially a day where you had a mass disinvestment i do encourage you to read page 77 in the textbook because um, it explains it really, really well. And there's quite a nice diagram um, halfway down the page that it just explains the whole cycle of what happened on the day. The fact that there's this mass disinvestment and those people who weren't quick enough to sell their shares, they the value of the shares that they actually own dropped to the point that they lost everything. Not only did they lose everything, but um, people then couldn't pay it. You know, it had a knock-on effect. They couldn't uh, pay banks back the loans that they owed. Um, banks then lost people's savings. Businesses closed. You ultimately ended up with a lot of businesses closing and people then going into, um, so, some people ending up in what was called Hoovervilles which were almost like informal settlements. So, you know, these are just just two pictures of, um, you know, newspaper front pages, but there are more. You just have to Google it, and there are tons of them just showing you what actually happened. And, I mean, it was a horror. So when I say the shock that was shot that was heard around the world, this here is a good example of that. So what then would have been the actual impact of this? The impact is what ended up being known as the Great Depression. The Great Depression being the ultimate situation where, you know, the ultimate sadness where people um, home, were homeless. There was overproduction because people continued to produce, but people then didn't have any money to actually buy. Trade uh, slowed, banks um, lost money. People lost everything. Uh, businesses closed. I mean, this is a picture of Herbert Hoover. And, um, it's one of the most famous cartoons at that time where Herbert Hoover is drawn, you know, with an exceptionally large head. And he just was always seen as never fully understanding the impact and always thinking that everything was going to be okay. At that time, you had increasing rates of suicide where you had uh, people who would work on Wall Street and through the shock, you know, would often jump off the buildings. So you've got Herbert Hoover saying, trust me, prosperity is just around the corner. And he is, uh, and around the corner is somebody actually jumping off a bridge. I am ruined. Well, maybe not this one. And ultimately what, well, so ultimately you have the Great Depression. And after this is, how do they get out of the Great Depression? What we then did was uh, textbook page 81 and activity 5.1. I hope this answers your questions and if you have any more then you're welcome to email me